this week marks 50 years since a dairy farm in New York State became the home for Woodstock and groundbreaking music history. To many, the festival is still seen as a defining symbol of 1960s counterculture, idealism, and the anti-war movement. But did it have a lasting impact? Jeffrey Brown is back now with a look at that weekend and what it means five decades later. It's part of our arts and culture series, Canvas. Does the richest and strongest nation in the... In the summer of 1969, Richard Nixon was in the White House. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I totally oppose this war. The Vietnam War raged on. And some 400,000 people made their way to a field outside the small town of Bethel, New York, for a gathering that would become one of the defining moments of an era. Michael Lang was one of the organizers of the Woodstock Festival. It's always important to promote peace, and music is a great way to sort of bring people together. A lot of the things that came out of the 60s, coming through the civil rights movement and women's rights, and really the advent of, of concern about the planet, which you know sort of grew out of that era, we were motivated, and we, we felt we could really have an effect on the way things worked in the world. Freedom, freedom. Idealism was still in the air two years after the so-called Summer of Love. But, says Todd Gitlin, author of the 60s, so was something else. It's a show of cheerful de defiance. Let's show that we can triumph over war assassinations. Many people who were there thought of the music as itself a feat of defiance. We are impervious. We are the real America. And what happened subsequently was that rebellion became the dominant culture. What began as a ticketed concert with promoters estimating 50,000 attendees quickly evolved into something very different. A free and free-form festival with a mass of humanity, stoked by an incredible lineup of some of the 60s' biggest rock stars. Janis Joplin, Santana, Sly and the Family Stone, and many more. Mostly helicoptered in after the roads were clogged and unpassable. They too got into the spirit. For a minute we were hopeful. For a minute we were not facing the Vietnam War. For a minute we were not facing losing the Kennedys. For a minute Dr. King's death wasn't hanging over us. For a minute we were behaving like decent humans. I'd heard a buzz in the air about this festival that was going to happen. Photographer Henry Diltz was on stage capturing it. I spent a couple of weeks um, documenting the building of the stage and the hog farm camping grounds and all that, and suddenly all these people showed up, you know. It was kind of photographed from all different angles, you know. Mine were mostly from on stage, and that sort of brings it all uh, into the present for everybody to remember. Photos are wonderful that way. This past week, Diltz, Michael Lang, and others gathered at the Morrison Hotel Gallery in New York City, and a line formed around the block with people young and old to reminisce or to learn about an event that's taken on the quality of myth. I'm really excited to see what's going on. A lot of spiritual awakening, a lot of pushing of certain movements, cultural movements. That's what I think it was done. It was a, a very joyous, for the most part. It was a little bit tense at times, a little tedious at times, but he, everybody, I think, had this shared feeling that something extremely important was happening. The food and water almost ran out, people got sick, and torrential rains turned the grounds into a mud bath. But somehow this instant city worked amid the high of music, drugs, and a feeling that maybe they really could change the world. One of Woodstock's most famous performances by Jimi Hendrix came early on its fourth morning. This is probably my favorite photo because it was my favorite moment, um, which happened to be the very ending of the whole festival. Jimi Hendrix, the headliner, was supposed to close the show Sunday night but it was so backed up that he went on Monday morning. So we were all a little bleary-eyed and this band of gypsies came out with these colorful bandanas. And it was quite an amazing show. And it was startling when he suddenly started playing the Star Spangled Banner. 
with all the sounds of war and everything, and we were so anti-war, every single person in that half a million crowd was against the war in Vietnam. In the end, there was a field of trash, soon enough cleaned up, and decades of wondering, what did it all mean? Just four months later, violence at the Altamont Festival in California shattered any sense of peace and love tied to music. Attempts to recreate the Woodstock atmosphere for 25th and 30th anniversaries were chaotic and marred by riots. And a 50th anniversary concert that Michael Lang hoped to present this weekend failed to come together amid denied permits and financial problems. It was disappointing. I mean, the purpose behind it was really to promote engagement, make sure people got out and voted this time, because I don't think things have ever been this critical in terms of what's going on on the planet. So we hoped that a festival would be kind of a way to focus on that. But we we're going to do it without the festival. For all the wonder of that moment in the summer of 69, for some, the Woodstock mystique belongs in a how we didn't change the world time capsule. Woodstock is sort of protected in history as a kind of moment of glory. I think it's delusional for people to think that you create that by simply packing hundreds of thousands of people into a field and celebrating. I mean, there's politics to be done. Uh, politics is in power. If people think that they can effervesce themselves into uh, salvation, then I think they're being misled or misleading themselves. These days, giant music festivals, huge commercial affairs have become the norm. And the country is once more hugely divided socially and politically. But bringing it all together, as happened in that field in upstate New York 50 years ago, it's hard to imagine we'll ever see the likes of Woodstock again. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Jeffrey Brown.